Thank you uh, so much for that, Linda. I'm hoping that um, everyone can hear me now. Um, please let me know if you cannot, Aaron. Uh, I'd like to just welcome everyone to uh, to this uh, special uh, version of, of uh, ROM Ideas, where we'll be talking about pandemic research and how our research has actually been um, affected by the pandemic. I think uh, we'll hear some some uh, positive notes as well as some some worries that that the pandemic have brought with them. Uh, hopefully, my talk will will at the very end at least um, allow you to have some positive thoughts about about um, the research that's ongoing at the ROM. Uh, you know, one of the things that this uh, particular setting, this virtual setting, allows me to do is is speak uh, about one of the mandates that we have as ROM curators, which are collection based research or or collections, expanding collections and developing collections. And so that's what most of my talk will be will be focusing on today. Um, so I, I sort of tongue in cheek uh, like to call my my talk uh, biodiversity does not take time off. Uh, if we do, then then biodiversity certainly does not. Um, and so I'd like to start off by just mentioning that that um, you know one of the mandates that we have as curators at the ROM is developing collections. It's only one of the things that we do, and we wear many different hats. We um, we do research, of course, we teach, we have uh, students that we supervise, uh, we do a lot of public communications, but one of the most important things, I think, is that we do expand and, and uh, use our collections for research, and, and the ROM collections really are a repository for both modern and historical information, um, and so we, we sort of use the collections to inform what has been to talk about what is happening in the world right now, and also to try to predict future events. Um, and we'll be, you'll be hearing some of that um, in today's talks, I think. Uh, most of you probably know that the ROM houses about 12 million, 13 million uh, specimens, objects, and artworks. And they really do span the gamut of, of uh, human interactions with the world and with each other through uh, our, this, this mandate that we have in art, culture, and nature. And so we have lots of, of objects that relate to these uh, three overarching fields, of course. Um, and so... What I will be talking about today is a lot of uh, about collections and and the way I think about natural history collections. And these are two of my my favorite photos of of uh, the natural history collections at the Royal Ontario Museum. And I like them because they really show the breadth of, of specimens and individuals that we have at the ROM. Uh, to the left here, you'll see the entomology collection, which includes the insects and arachnids, uh, which houses some five million specimens or so. Uh, and to the right is the ornithology collection or the bird collection, which has a spectacular assortment of, of birds from around the world. And so all I want to do here is just sort of give everyone an, an, a glimpse of, of the collections at the ROM. If you haven't been able to, to have a behind the scenes tour at the ROM, this is uh, what the collection spaces can look like. Uh, and they're quite spectacular uh, at that. So I just wanna give a, an, an, an idea of what the collections are uh, at the ROM. I am the curator of invertebrates. I work with all the animals that lack a backbone. And only in invertebrates, we have somewhere in the vicinity of 1.25, 1.27 uh, million specimens. And these are two, two photos here that I, I like to show. Uh, the right photo shows uh, specimens that are, are in the database, that are in the collections that we regularly work on. And the photo to the left here shows part of the backlog that we have in terms of specimens that need further identification, they need some further work um, to then be placed in the collection proper. And so uh, what I want to say here really is that the, the, the collections at the ROM really drive the research that we do. And this is why we have, uh, you know, so many specimens at our disposal at any given time at the ROM. Uh, the invertebrate collection, I should say, houses uh, you know, 38 of the 39 major groups of animals in the world. Um, any other collection at the ROM will house part of one of the remaining one, um, sort of phylum, as we call it, bigger groups of organisms. And so the, the invertebrate collection is very, very diverse when it comes to that higher, those higher level categories. Uh, and it's one of the reasons that we have both dry specimens and wet specimens, et cetera. Okay, so I'd like to talk a bit about how I view natural history collections. Why do we actually need 1.27 million individuals to be able to perform a research? And this will be, this will sort of be a good segue into understanding how the pandemic has affected research and, and what we do uh, to try to overcome the, the problems that are imposed by this, by this pandemic. 
So I like to think uh, about the uh, collections in this way. Uh, here you'll see a, a video soon when I turn it on. <clears throat> and the video, of course, is made up of, of stills, right? They're, they're each, each frame, when put together, creates a moving image. Uh, now, these frames, if you lift out any one of these frames, it might look like this gentleman is having a, a grand old time. It's only when you put the frames together that you will see that he's actually in a bit of trouble and will fall down. So any frame on its own uh, will only give you uh, one, one piece of information, but strung together as a, as a, a string of frames, a motion starts to develop. We'll uh, be able to see the video and we'll get a lot more information out of, out of the, uh, the frames. Now, natural history collections are much the same in my point of view. We'll have stills of specimens that we gather uh, across the world, but it's only when we string these stills together to create a moving image that we get all the information that we need from these frames. So any given frame might look like this leech in this case uh, is, is sort of doing something very different than what it is. It's actually hunting for, for food, in this case, blood. Um, but using any one of those stills, we wouldn't be able to uh, infer that information. Now, imagine that natural history collections, much like frames, uh, include numerous specimens that have information about a specific timeline throughout the history of the planet. Imagine instead of uh, a gentleman falling over when he's on rollerblades or a, a specimen that's moving around and hunting for blood, that we're talking about major events throughout the, the evolution of the planet. We might be talking about extinction and speciation events. We might be talking about movements across continents or across countries. Uh, how climate change affects the distribution of biodiversity across the world, uh, how organisms evolve to become useful to humans or useful to other animals in any given way. So much in the same way as the frames become movies, specimens become evolution. They paint the picture of evolution. And we need so many specimens because each specimen holds information about a given time and a given place in the world and strung together, they can start to paint a larger picture that allows us to understand the past and the, and the present, but also to predict the future, which is very, very important, uh, and especially uh, during a global pandemic. So that's the way I think about natural history collections. So you might ask yourself quite often, why do we need so many, so many specimens? Well, one of the reasons is this, that we need to be able to paint uh, as, as complete of a picture of evolution and biodiversity expansion uh, throughout time, right? And that's where the repositories or the collections at the ROM come into play because we, we deal with uh, specimens, <clears throat> you know, that date back hundreds of millions of years all the way up until the present. And through those strings of frames, we are allowed to predict what might actually happen in the future. Okay, so I tried to set the stage in terms of why collections are important and, and speaking a bit about the, the collections that we have at the ROM. During the pandemic, a lot of researchers have found that there are there, you know, some issues have been have come to light when it comes to expanding collections, and that's what I'm going to be talking about uh, mostly today is, is collection based research. Of course, everyone's worried that fewer collections can be can be done during COVID simply because of provincial and, and federal restrictions to movement. Um, we cannot travel uh, as as well as we could no international travel and in many cases. Um, travels are restricted within countries as well. And as a result, we won't be able to, during this period of time, um, collect the frames that, we are, that are needed to paint the picture of evolution throughout the pandemic. Now, I can give you some, some good news here. Uh, one thing is that the, the ROM is very devoted to fieldwork. Uh, and so we are trying our best to, within governmental restrictions and, and following all the, uh, all the guidelines from the provincial uh, government and the federal government, the ROM is devoted to maintaining uh, or, or expanding the collections that we have at the ROM. There is no international travel, as we all know, and, and I'm sure that uh, a lot of you are, are grieving that you might not be able to see friends or family abroad. Um, and uh, researchers at the ROM are also I'm sort of a bit sad that we won't be able to continue this international mandate that we have of, of 
expanding and understanding biodiversity globally across, across the earth. Um, but we are seeing a shift towards regional and local sampling. And I don't think that this is a bad idea. And this is what I meant by uh, doing research in your backyard. You know, we, we're, we're shifting our focus from international fieldwork to maybe focusing on, on Canadian fieldwork or even Ontario fieldwork and trying to understand what's in our backyard um, before we go to all these exotic places outside of, uh, of Ontario. So even though you might think that we don't have the, we won't get the frames to to uh, put together this string um, of, of videos, uh, we are um, very much um, getting, trying to get the frames despite of this pandemic and following all the guidelines that are needed. And so I'd like to to just put everyone's mind at ease that the ROM is devoted to to continuing our, our understanding of the natural uh, natural world. And we are absolutely trying to get the, the frames that are needed or the specimens that are needed to show the video of evolution. Okay, let's see. Okay, so researchers have actually already touched on this in several different papers. And we're seeing a lot of papers pop up now where um, we're trying to understand what the pandemic has actually done for or against um, biodiversity. And a lot of this actually, um, is, is contained within the concept of conservation. Our conservation, of course, is, is trying to help and maintain populations of animals across the, across the globe. And I'll, what these papers, I think, share is that they are slightly worried that the uh, global recession in the economy will lead to fewer, um, fewer uh, finances being sort of devoted to biodiversity conservation. But what they're also showing is that biodiversity is actually uh, shifting towards more local and regional um, uh, approaches. So whereas we previously would go to very, very um, you know, exotic places around the world, what we're doing now instead is trying to focus on, on the, uh, the biodiversity and the evolution that is happening around us. So we're seeing this shift towards a Canadian exploration. Now, I will say, and, and some of you may have heard this as well, that one of the things that are highlighted in all of these papers that are now coming out that relate to uh, COVID-19 and how it's affected biodiversity is that we're seeing that biodiversity animals are actually moving into areas where they have previously not been present. And one of the reasons we think is that there is less human presence in these areas now. And this is from both very, very small animals to very large animals that we see a shift in the, dis in the distribution of these animals and they are moving sort of closer to humans. Um, and I think that that's to be expected. We know that humans actually occupy niches that otherwise would be occupied um, by other animals. And so moving away from those areas will allow other animals to move in. One of the things that I wanted to talk about was how we actually do this empirically, how we have, uh, um, forwarded our research and our collection-based research in particular throughout the pandemic. And my lab um, had the, the opportunity now to, um, this past summer, do some collecting in Ontario. And I will say that, you know, I, I come from Sweden. Um, I was born and raised in Sweden. And uh, people ask me there, you know, what is it like uh, being in, uh, in, in Canada right now? Can you travel around? Can you uh, can you can you go to different places? How is your field work? Uh, can can you go and collect? And I tell them, you know what? I, I try to stay within Ontario. That's what the provincial and federal guidelines mandate me to do. But it turns out that Ontario is about twice the size of Sweden, so I have a, a, a huge area to to work with. And so this past summer, we we did uh, ten days of field work in what most people would call uh, the nor northern Ontario, I guess, which only is about a third of the way up the province. Um, but we did field work along Highway 11 and then over to Thunder Bay and then all the way back to Toronto again. Uh, this takes about 30 hours to drive, as you can see here. But uh, in reality, it took us 10 days to do all the field work here. And instead of about 2,900 kilometers, we did about 3,500 kilometers all said and done. And we managed to gather a lot of, of very, very good specimens. And I'll talk a bit about this field work now and then I'll try to to uh, open it back up again, or, or try to clo close all the lines when I, when I get to the, the uh, closing slides here. Um, okay, so we did field work across um, Highway 11. There are regions in even, even closer to Toronto that have yet to be sampled, that have yet to be understood when it comes to the distribution of biodiversity. And what I think we saw during this trip is that, um, you know, 
um, biodiversity is not taking time off during this pandemic, of course. Um, we're seeing a, a lot of, of high abundance of, of organisms in remote areas, but also closer to humans than we would otherwise have expected them. Now, of course, animals that are that travel easily, like insects or, or other flying animals, um, they can get to, to uh, regions that are otherwise uh, occupied by humans very quickly. Other animals will take some time. If, they, if they're crawlers, they'll take quite a long time to get to these different regions. But what we found during this field work is that um, abundance is, is very, very high when it comes to at least the leeches that we were looking for. But when we look for leeches, we also look for uh, other animals as well. And we were seeing very, very high abundances of animals. And so I just wanted to show a couple of photos here of, of me doing field work. And and if you don't know what we do when we do leech field work is that we put shorts on and we walk into the water and we let the organisms come to us, which is quite easy. Now, I wanted to show these, these photos simply to give everyone an, an understanding that field work is ongoing at the ROM. We are committed to, to continuing our collection expansion. And so I just wanted to show some evidence of that uh, with me in the water here. And to the right here is, is one of the target species that we were looking for on this particular trip, uh, Macrobella decora, or the, the North American medicinal leech. And we managed to find uh, several populations of this leech. We brought them back to Toronto. We kept them alive. We monitored their behavior. Uh, but the other thing that we did also was that we lifted out the salivary glands that they have and tried to explore the different ways in which they uh, inhibit the coagulation of blood. They have very strong, very potent anticoagulants in their saliva. And one of the things that we wanted to do was try to understand which of these anticoagulants are used before feeding, so used for other, other things than blood feeding, which ones are turned on when, when the leech is feeding, and which ones are turned off very quickly after the leech is feeding. And this, uh, these data points will allow us to try to explain um, what drives the diversity of, of these blood thinners or anticoagulants in leech saliva. And we know that leech saliva has uh, some of the highest proportions of anticoagulants anywhere found in the animal kingdom. And so this was a very, very important um, project, and it was a project that needed to be undertaken now because it's a, it was a, um, uh, the, the final project of one of my PhD students who's hopefully going to defend soon. And, um, and so it needed to be done, and the ROM was very helpful in, in allowing us to go uh, and do the field work and following, you know, it's important to state that we did follow uh, provincial and federal guidelines, of course. And it was uh, because only households could go, I, I entrusted my uh, my wife to be my um, my uh, field assistant here, and she's been on trips with me before and, and proved, has proven herself as a very, very good field assistant when it comes to leech collecting. The more legs you have in the water, the easier it is to collect leeches. That's what I always say. Okay, so um, I we, we found lots and lots of different species of leeches. We found, I found a higher diversity than we ever thought that we would. Now, how much of that is due to leeches moving into new areas because of the pandemic? It's, it's difficult to say, but what we can say is that we found several new species, species that had not been found before, even in our backyard. This is an area of the world that is quite highly um, sort of understood. We think that we understand the distribution in <clears throat> most Western countries. Um, but Canada is so large, of course, and Ontario is so large that it's difficult to, to have scanned the entire province. But what we found was that, that we have a very, very high abundance of leeches, species that uh, hadn't been found in, in this area of the world before. Um, and we also found a lot of new, new species. And just if anyone is wondering if leeches are actually thriving uh, during the pandemic, I wanted to show this video of leeches sort of swimming at you, right? This is kind of easy field work when, when the organisms come to you. Um, oddly enough, this is a non-blood feeding species, but it is a species that nonetheless swims and comes to you. So it was quite, quite easy field work because we, you know, we, uh, the, the organisms hunt us rather than us hunting them. So I just wanted to show that as, a, as an indication of, of the fact that leeches and other animals actually are thriving throughout this pandemic. They are not taking time off. Okay, so there are a couple of things, a uh, couple of issues that the researchers have raised in the past when it comes to how research has, has changed during this global pandemic. One of the things, of course, is that data creation is quite difficult. Everyone's working from home. The big labs that help us sequence 
uh, DNA, for example, or RNA are, are a lot of them have been closed. They are now starting to open up again. Uh, we do have a, a very good lab and very good technicians at the Royal Ontario Museum that have helped us to create um, new data, but it's been quite difficult to create data. And so what we've relied on is all of the data that we've gathered so far. And I can only speak for myself, but I think that I speak for most researchers at the ROM when I say that there's always a backlog of projects that, that need uh, tending to. And what this pandemic has helped us to do is, is instead of generating new data and, and sort of forgetting about the backlog of projects, it's allowed us to use all the data in a very, very um, thoughtful way um, moving forward and, and sort of diminishing this backlog of projects that, that are underlying. And this is what I hear from, from researchers across the world is that instead of generating lots of new data, they're actually taking, taking the time to think about the, the um, the specimens and the DNA data that they already have and, and using the collections for, for what they're supposed to be used for, which is um, sort of understanding the past, the present and predicting the future. And what we are seeing is that we're moving from an international stage to more local or regional collection expansions. And I think that this is a, a good thing. I mean, we think that we understand um, the diversity that's present in our backyard, but I can tell you that we don't. And I know that for a fact, simply because we are finding new species every time we go out and we collect regionally and locally. The virtual setting, in my opinion, um, sort of sounds like it might be, uh, um, it might hinder collaborations across borders. But I think that because everyone is now so used to Zoom or Teams or any of the other virtual settings, that uh, collaborations are actually facilitated by, by um, the, the global pandemic somehow. And that is because we are all used to speaking with each other on uh, in a computer setting. And so we're a bit more comfortable doing so. And we reach out to each other a bit more than we would otherwise. And so in my opinion, actually, in my experience, this virtual setting has really facilitated collaborations across the world. And each of us can collect specimens or look at the biodiversity, try to understand evolution in our part of the world, and then bring that to the, to the table and try to, un, try to synthesize all the data to create something um, that we can use to understand biodiversity and evolution globally. So I think that the bottom line is that even though it sounds as though uh, COVID-19 and the, and the global pandemic might have put restrictions on the research that is going on and the field work that's being done, um, I don't think that everything is negative. There are a lot of highlights to this, and I think it's good that we're moving our eyes towards a more local or regional understanding of biodiversity. I think that it's good that we are bridging gaps now uh, or bridging borders when it comes to continents and, and countries. Uh, and a lot of new collaborations have been started because of, because of this virtual setting. And so not everything is negative when it comes to, to um, the, the pandemic and how it has affected the uh, the biodiversity and, and our understanding of evolution. And with that, I just wanted to take a second to thank everyone that, that is part of, of the research that we've done and that's been part of, of the collection trip that I mentioned, uh, but that also work very, very hard to, um, to maintain the collections and to, to make sure that they're utilized in the way that they should be and, and to the best of their abilities. Uh, Maureen Sabowski in the top left and, and Don Stacy at the bottom left are the two technicians at the, at the Royal Ontario Museum in the invertebrate section. And they do an absolutely fantastic job with uh, working through the pandemic, databasing everything and helping out and, and making sure that the collections that we have are open to researchers around the world so that they can take part in the, in the knowledge that we, that we accumulate here in Ontario and Canada and across the globe. I'd like to thank my, my beautiful wife, of course, who was such a good um, field assistant and the entire Quist lab and of course all the leeches um, that, we, that we collected during this trip. Okay, so in order to, to follow the timeline, I think I'll, I'll quickly pass it over to uh, Justin Jennings, who I think will be talking about the evolution of fairness. Thank you everyone for attending. Thank you for listening. I'll be happy to take any questions towards the end of this session.